Hi students, it's Professor Bridget again, and we are now going to be learning about the urinary system once again, and this is urinary system part two. Where we left off last time was learning about blood flow into and out of the kidneys. Let me just orient you here real quick. You're just looking at one small lobule of the kidney. And one of the things we learned in the last lecture were the regions. So there's the cortex, and then you can see the medulla just below that. And one of the things I'd like to draw your attention to here right off the bat is that there are structures that only exist in the cortex and then structures that only exist in the medulla. Another thing I want to draw your attention to before we move on are the blood vessels that we've just learned about. Your authors are showing you parts of them. So this one right here, the one that kind of drapes over the top of the medullary pyramid, that's the arcuate artery. And then this next section that you see right here moving upwards or extending really the, the width of the cortex, that is the interlobular artery. And then these small branches that you see coming off this direction, that would be an afferent arterial. So I'm just uh, trying to link what we just left off on uh, here in this first, um, this first slide. So there's a structure, or not a structure, millions of structures inside the kidney that we refer to as nephrons. And it's the nephrons that are going to be doing the uh, filtration of the blood. So different parts of the nephron are going to have different structures, have different functions, and as you, have, you can see here, uh, different locations as well. So if we start breaking down a nephron into its individual components, we can see that the nephron is made up of a structure called the renal corpuscle and structures called renotubules. Those two things come together to create what we refer to as the nephron. So I'm going to erase what I wrote and show you these parts. Okay, so the renal corpuscle is this structure right here. Corpuscle means little body. So this is the little part of the kidney, the little body in the kidney. And what you see on the left side of the image here is a beige structure. That's just a very thin covering over what you see here on the right. So what you see here on the right, that red ball of yarn, that is actually located inside of this little beige structure. That's called the renal corpuscle. And then this system of tubes that you see all around here, those are what we refer to as the renal tubules. So the nephron as a whole, it's responsible for filtering out waste products from the blood and conserving nutrients or pulling nutrients uh, from the blood that the body would like to send um, back into the blood eventually. That's going to be the wrap-up. When I explain that, we'll ex I'll be explaining that at the very end to wrap up this whole story. But we're just taking it bit by bit at this point. So let's look at the renal corpuscle first and look at its two components. The outside covering is what we call Bowman's capsule, or sometimes that's called the glomerular capsule. Depends on the author of you or what it is you're reading. But that's this really thin capsule that surrounds the rest of the corpuscle. That Bowman's capsule is so thin because it's made out of a layer of simple squamous epithelial tissue. 
The structure that you see inside that red ball of yarn, I'll just circle it here, is called the glomerulus. So Bowman's capsule plus the glomerulus makes up what we call the renal corpuscle. These renal corpuscles, corpuscles only exist in the cortex. So if you were looking at a section of the kidney underneath the microscope and you were seeing glomeruli, that's plural for glomerulus, if you were seeing glomeruli, you would know that you're looking at the cortex of the kidney. So that's those two structures. Again, let me erase so it doesn't get too messy. And the next thing I, I would like to, hey, okay, I'd like to um, tell you about is the function of the renal corpuscle. So in the previous lecture, we just left off on, uh, we just left off on blood flow into the kidney. And this glomerulus that you see, that red ball of yarn, is a knot of fenestrated capillaries. Remember fenestrated capillaries are like Swiss cheese, they're very porous. And so if you look right here, there's that afferent arteriole. And so you're gonna get blood that needs to be cleansed or filtered uh, coming in through this afferent arteriole. And then that afferent arteriole essentially gives rise to this glomerulus. And the blood is gonna travel through the glomerulus through the fenestrated capillaries of the glomerulus in this fashion, and then ultimately leave out um, what we call the efferent arteriole. So you've essentially got blood flowing at pretty high pressure through the fenestrated capillaries that are the glomerulus. And what's gonna happen here, because those the glomerulus is fenestrated capillaries, products are going to um, be pushed out of the glomerulus and end up in the capsule. But only products or um, atoms and molecules that are small enough to fit through the holes in the fenestrated capillaries. So things like sodium, those are ions, right? So sodium might leak out. You might get some chloride leaking out. You'll have water leaking out. Glucose is small enough to leak out of that fenest those fenestrated capillaries. And so whatever can leak out of those fenestrated capillaries ends up trapped in this little capsule. Uh, red blood cells, too big to pass through. So this area here, Bowman's capsule, fills up with what we call filtrate. And that filtrate should only contain molecules that were small enough to fit through the fenestrations on the, um, on the glomerulus. Now we don't want um, everything that can manage to slip out those fenestrations to slip out. So what you see here, let me erase my blood flow. So making up an important part of the glomerulus are these little peach-like structures that you see on top of the fenestrated capillaries. So I'll use a black pen. So there's the nucleus of one of those structures. The structures are called podocytes. Podo means foot, right? And so they've got all these little extensions that kind of wrap around the fenestrated capillaries. Those podocytes are going to do a couple of things. One gives structure and stability to the fenestrated capillaries, the glomerulus, and they're going to kind of plug up some of the holes in the fenestrated capillaries to limit the size of the molecules that can leave the fenestrated capillaries and make their way into the capsule. So essentially, this limits the size of the molecules that are escaping the blood and ending up as filtrate. We don't want some of the larger amino acids or proteins, we don't want those to become part of the filtrate in the Bowman's capsule. We might like some of those things just to pass through the glomerulus 
and then pass right back out again. So they, they don't have a chance of being eliminated as urine. So we just finished blood flow through the uh, glomerulus. As you know, uh, comes in through the afferent arterial, passes through the glomerulus here, and then blood leaves through the efferent arterial. And we also just learned that this space right here, oops, I don't want to use that, that that space, the Bowman's capsule, is where the filtrate collects. Well, that's great, but where does that filtrate go? That filtrate is going to leave the glomerulus through this tube right here. And this tube is part of the renal tubules. It has a specific name, we'll get to it in a second. So now we're gonna be tracing the flow of this filtrate that's been created, essentially waste products from the blood. And we're gonna tr trace that flow of that filtrate through the kidney and into the ureter, into the bladder, and into the external environment. So that brings us to the second um, part of a nephron, and those are what we call the renal tubules. So the renal tubules are all of these tubes that you see here. So everything except the renal corpuscle. You find parts of those renal tubules in the cortex, parts of those renal tubules in the medulla. And what the renal tubules are doing are reabsorbing any water that made its way into Bowman's capsule, reabsorbing salts and nutrients from that filtrate in Bowman's capsule, but also carrying products that are destined uh, to become uh, components of urine. And so where we're going to focus our efforts now are on these renal tubules the different sections of those renal tubules carry out functions. So let's look at the first section, and I'll just kind of circle it for you here. That section right there is what we refer to as the proximal convoluted tubule. Now this is a body tube, and what you've learned is that all body tubes are lined with an epithelium. So the epithelium here is simple cuboidal. Simple cuboidal has either an absorptive function or a secretory function. So here it kind of plays a role in doing both. It does, these cells do have microvilli on their surface. So that should tell you that this area or this section of tube is really good at reabsorbing water, nutrients, and salts. But it also has a secretory function that um, proximal convoluted tubule would also be maybe secreting excess hydrogen ions or excess potassium. But that's something you'll learn more about in physiology. Then we move on to this next section of tubules that dip down into the medulla. And that's what we call the loop of Henle. The whole thing is called the loop of Henle. The loop of Henle has parts that, or one side that, where the tube is uh, descending down into the medulla, and then you see it makes a U-turn, and that tube goes back up the medulla. So one side is called the descending limb of the loop of Henle. Let me erase this. So here's that descending limb right here. That's the descending limb of the loop of Henle. It extends down into the medullary pyramids. It's a continuation of this body tube, the distal convoluted tubule, or sorry, proximal convoluted tubule. It's a continuation of that. And this part of the tube is lined with simple squamous. And this part of the tube is only able to reabsorb water. So that filtrate, let me just zoom in here for a sec. I'll do the filtrate in blue. That filtrate is left Bowman's capsule and it's 
circulating through first the proximal convoluted tubules, and then that filtrate continues on down this descending limb of the loop of Henle. And then that filtrate is going to make a U-turn and go back up. And then it's going to become a different section of the tube called the ascending limb of the loop of Henle. It's going back up the medulla. And so that filtrate is going to come back up that ascending limb of the loop of Henle. Again, it's a continuation of that tube. It's made with, or it's lined with simple cuboidal epithelial tissue. But here, only salts are reabsorbed. So, continuing on from there, will uh, uh, the ascending limb will give rise to this area of tube, and that is called the distal convoluted tubule, and it's carrying filtrate as well. So let's move to the next slide. The distal convoluted tubule is now lined with simple cuboidal. It's able to reabsorb salt or water if needed, and this section of the tube is only located in the cortex. Okay. From there, the filtrate is going to leave, and it's going to pass down this tube right here, which is called a collecting duct. Those collecting ducts are going to drain into this region right here, which would be a minor calyx. This author is saying renal papilla. That's the tip of a medulla right there is the renal papilla. But this area that's beige right here, that's a minor calyx. Before we move on and follow the filtrate from the collecting ducts, I want you to start thinking about something. We've, or I've just mentioned that um, these tubes are reabsorbing things. What I mean by that is, let's say for instance, in the descending limb of the loop of Henle, it's job is to reabsorb water. So water is going to leave this tube. Water molecules are going to leave that descending limb and end up in the tissue <clears throat> surrounding the tube. Okay, well we know that something very similar happens in the GI tract, right? Where nutrients leave the tube. But where did those nutrients go when they left the tube that is the small intestine. Those nutrients got picked up by blood vessels. And the same is true here. Everywhere along the, the renal tubules where something is being reabsorbed, even up here, like sodium and water are being reabsorbed. Glucose can be reabsorbed here too. They're not showing it to you in these pictures but there are gonna be blood vessels, a network of blood vessels that wrap around all of these tubes. And you know I'm not a very good artist. There are gonna be blood vessels here that are gonna pick up those products that are being reabsorbed by those sections of tubes. I'm gonna get back to this at the very end of the lecture, but I wanted you guys to start thinking, well, Bridget, you said that these things get reabsorbed. Reabsorbed to where? Where do they go? They make their way into the tissue that surrounds the nephron itself. So we just followed the pathway that filtrate is um, moving down those collecting ducts and making its way towards the minor calyx. So in all of these medullary pyramids, you're gonna have those collecting ducts draining filtrate into the minor calyx. When that filtrate finally makes its way into the minor calyx, that's when we call it urine. And the reason we don't call it urine prior to that is because prior to dripping into the minor calyces, that filtrate can still be modified, even if it's just a little bit, it can still be modified. 
some uh, uh, ions secreted into the filtrate or uh, water or ions being reabsorbed. But once that filtrate drips into the minor calyx, no more modification can occur, and now it is officially urine and will be excreted out of the body. So that filtrate is going to drip down those minor calyces, and you know that those minor calyces come together to make major calyces. So all of these calyces right here are going to have urine dripped into them. And then ultimately that urine makes its way to the renal pelvis. And then ultimately that urine is going to make its way to the ureter. And this ureter is a muscular tube that's lined with transitional epithelium. The muscle surrounding the ureter is going to contract and through fit peristalsis, squeeze urine down the ureter. Imagine the ureter being a straw and you were to take your fingers um, on either side of the straw at the top and slide your fingers down the straw. And that's essentially peristalsis. You're squeezing a tube and sliding um, down the tube. So urine is going to get um, drawn down the ureter via peristalsis. So let's go back also, though, and try and think about why the ureter would be lined in transitional epithelial tissue. If you recall, transitional epithelial tissue, its function is to accommodate stretch. So when large volumes of urine are being produced, the tube that is the ureter has the ability to expand. So from the kidneys, that uh, urine is going to drip down these ureters. So each one of these structures are ureters. And those ureters actually um, drip urine. You can't see it, but they, those ureters actually um, drip urine down through these two holes. So if I could draw the tube where the ureter actually travels to, it travels to about here. And it drips urine into those two openings. And those two openings are called the urethral openings. Watch the spelling. Urethral. It sounds very similar to urethral with an H. So urine, I'm just going to make it yellow now just because urine is going to start to drip from those urethral openings into the bladder. And the way out of the bladder for that urine is going to be through this hole right here. And that's called the internal urethral orifice. The internal urethral orifice that is regulated by the internal urethral sphincter, a muscle a smooth muscle that's going to hold, when it's contracted, will hold urine inside the bladder. Those three structures, the two urethral openings plus the um, internal urethral orifice, make up a structure that we call the trigon. So this whole area that I'm highlighting right here is called the trigon. And it's called the trigon because this is where you have the highest concentration of stretch receptors, specialized neurons that monitor stretch. So they're going to be embedded in the muscular wall of the bladder. And so when urine starts to build up here, uh, the bladder will stretch and that sends a signal to the brain that the bladder is becoming full. And we recognize this as the need to go to the bathroom or the urge to go to the bathroom. This is what we physically feel when we, um, when we feel like we need to go to the bathroom. So that's the trigon. Urine from there then, it passes through the internal urethral orifice into what we call the urethra. Oops, the urethra which is this tube right here. And so this tube, the urethra, 
is going to allow urine to pass through it and ultimately out of the body. Now this is a female example because obviously there's no there's no penis here, but um, I want to point out like this section of the urethra here is inside the body, inside the pelvic cavity. And then the muscle that you see right here, that's the muscle that is the body wall. So that urethra um, passes through the body wall, and then this would be outside the body. Now, urine flow out of the bladder is in part um, under conscious control. And let me tell you how that works. Embedded in the muscular wall of the, of the, or the body wall, is a muscle right here called the external urethral sphincter. That's skeletal muscle. So you do have conscious control over that muscle right there. And you do have the ability to contract that muscle and compress the urethra right here and hold back the urine. So you do have part voluntary control over uh, urine leaving the bladder in the body. So here we go. You can see that it's serous membrane, this sheet right on top. And then on the inferior side down here, it would be dense connective tissue and that anchors the bladder within the pelvic cavity. You don't want the bladder to collapse and fall to the uh, pelvic floor. You want it... Um, Let's look a little bit more closely uh, at the bladder as an organ, a hollow body tube. And you're gonna see another pattern here that we've seen over and over again, is that the outermost layer of this body tube is either gonna be covered uh, with a serous membrane, like on the superior side, anterior, posterior, and inferior. On the lateral sides, it's going to, or sorry, on the inferior side, it's covered with uh, dense connective tissue. And that's going to bind the muscular, uh, to the muscular wall of the pelvis. So this is the way in which the bladder stays upright and anchored in place. Upright. The middle layer of the bladder is made of three layers of smooth muscle. That smooth muscle is called or named the detrusor muscle. And those three layers of muscle are what contract during urination to uh, cause or to squeeze urine out of the bladder. So if we look at the three different slides that I have down here, you can see the one on the far left is the entire bladder as a whole. This is probably from a fetal mouse or something. And if we were to just zoom in on one section of it right here, we'd be able to see that um, detrusor muscle. You should be able to recognize it. It's all of this. All of that would be that smooth muscle layer. Um, if we go to the picture all the way to the right, what you find is lining the, the inner wall of the bladder is going to be a mucosa, like we've seen elsewhere, that's made of transitional epithelium. The reason for that is to accommodate stretch. You also see, if we pull back a little bit, these folds right here in the mucosa. You can see them over on the far left as well. Seen those in the stomach before? Those are called rugae. So the mucosa here is folded into rugae, and the rugae in the bladder carry out the same function as the rugae in the stomach. They are meant to allow for stretch, so the bladder can uh, fill up with urine and stretch out if necessary, and then go back to its original shape when it's empty. So earlier I mentioned that there are differences between male and female urethrae. And one, as you might expect, is the male urethra is a lot longer than the females. The males is about 18 centimeters, 
versus four centimeters long in the female. And that's because there is a longer structure outside the male body that carries urine away, and that's the penis. So inside the penis is going to be that extra length of the urethra carrying urine outside the body. And I'll show this to you here. Let me just... So that's the difference in length. Males have a longer urethra than females. So we break up the urethra into three different parts in males. There is what we call the first part is the prostatic urethra. Give me a sec. So there's the prostatic urethra. And that's the first segment that comes from the bladder through the internal sphincter and through the prostate. I'll show you all of these all at one time. Then there's the membranous urethra, and then there's the penile urethra. You could also call that the spongy urethra. Let me show you real quick. Here we go. So here would be the urethra in males, still leading away from the bladder and carrying urine to the external environment. But if you look at the bottom picture, see how much shorter the female urethra is? And it's because of this difference in length that females are more prone to bladder infections and other urinary tract infections. And the reason for that is bacteria can easily make their way into, I'm running out of space here, into the urethra. And those bacteria then would love to live inside the bladder. It's a nice, warm, wet environment, nutrient rich. And so those bacteria, when they uh, are the wrong type and they flourish, can cause what we call a bladder infection. And in severe cases, those bacteria can even migrate up the ureters and then ultimately kidneys would be somewhere up here. So when that happens and those bacteria cause inflammation in the kidney, that's what we call a kidney infection. And if you've ever had one of those, I haven't myself, but if you've ever had one of those or know somebody who has, they, uh, that person will tell you that's incredibly painful. And oftentimes um, it may require hospitalization or IV antibiotics in order to combat that infection. These on this picture. I'm gonna erase the drawings I made before because they're not relevant, not now anyway. Okay, so let's break up the male urethra into its different parts. I'm gonna choose a different color here. I'll use red. So this section of the urethra is the prostatic urethra. It's traveling through the prostate gland. The prostate gland is that green donut that you see there. The second section of the male urethra is the membranous urethra. And that is outside of the body. So it's an external section of the urethra at the base of the penis. And then the remainder of the urethra is what we refer to as the penile urethra or spongy urethra. And that's going to be the final section that's carrying urine out of the body. The last difference between male and female urethrae is that in males, the urethra is both a urinary structure carrying urine out of the body, but also a reproductive structure because both urine and sperm both pass through that tube. And we'll talk more about how that happens in um, when we get to male reproductive system. In females, only urine passes out that urethra, okay? So up until this point, we were able to follow blood flow into the kidney and blood flow out of the kidney. When blood flows into the kidney, it's going to get filtered by these structures called nephrons. And we learned about the structure of the nephron and the function of each part of the nephron. Everything that you see here in yellow is the nephron.
And one of the things that nephrons do, or different parts of the nephron do, is reabsorb products. So remember that um, products are going to get absorbed through the wall of this tube here, and they end up in the tissue outside the tube. Well, it doesn't do the body any good to have these, um, these, these products building up outside the tube and just staying there. They're not going to do the body, um, they're not going to be useful to the body if they are not taken into the bloodstream. So, surrounding the distal convoluted tubule, a proximal convoluted tubule, and the loop of Henle is the system of vessels that you see here in uh, red and also in blue. So these are what we call peritubular capillaries. I'll write the name over here for you. It's essentially a capillary bed. So what leaks out of these tubes, let's say it's water, for instance, water is going to end up, I'm not actually right there. Let me do this the right way. So let's say water ends up in the tissue on the outside of this tube, right here on the descending limb. That water, all it has to do, it's going to diffuse into these blood vessels. Or if it's salt over on the right side, sodium ions, sodium ions are going to leak out of the tube in that direction. And they're going to just get absorbed right into the blood vessels. And all of these blood vessels are what they're doing, or the capillary bed, pardon me, the paratubular capillaries are um, surrounding the renal tubules and then allowing for those things that have been reabsorbed to make their way back in the blood back into the bloodstream and eventually leave the kidney in the blood through a part of the renal vein so those items remember could be sodium could be chloride could be potassium could be water could be glucose could be amino acids those are things that at different times and depending on what your body needs, those are things that are going to get reabsorbed from the tubes, from the renal tubules into the blood. And then that blood is carried out of the kidney and that blood carried back to the heart and these things redistributed one more time around or maybe a couple more times around. So that's the function of the peritubular capillaries. And then one kind of uh, last, not random thing, but sort of semi-off topic, or a new topic rather, are the different types of nephrons that humans have. We have what we call cortical nephrons and juxtamedullary nephrons. And there's about a four to one ratio. So we've got four cortical nephrons for every juxtamedullary nephron that we have. And let me... Um, just give you some a landmark here. This is cortex in this picture. And the rest of this, even though it's cut off, would be the medulla. So cortical nephrons have the majority of their structures in the cortex. And you can see that's pretty clear there. Juxtamedullary nephrons have the majority of their tubes in the medulla. So you can see how um, that is. The juxtamedullary nephrons, as you might have noticed, have a really long loop of Henle. And that long loop of Henle, or remember earlier we learned that the loops of Henle are, um, at least in part, responsible for reabsorbing water. So the longer a loop of Henle is, or the descending limb of the loop of Henle is, the more water that can be reabsorbed per unit time. So you essentially increase the surface area for absorption. So these types of nephrons, 
they would be found in higher ratios in organisms that perhaps live in the desert and need to make really highly concentrated urine. Humans, uh, we don't have nearly as many juxtamedullary nephrons. We've got other, other methods, and we've we've got a, we live in an environment, where uh, water is pretty pretty easy for us to access. So, um, anyways, that's just something kind of fun. I know that you'll learn about cortical versus juxtamedullary nephrons once you get to your physiology class. So that's the reason I like to bring it up. Okay, so that is the conclusion of the urinary system part two, and that's the last for the last lecture for the urinary system. There's no part three.